Good morning again, friends. It is uh, a wonderful blessing to be together, isn't it? Especially on this, this great occasion where we're focusing our attention on the, the blessing of God's faithfulness to us. It has been, <clears throat> the past six weeks has been a wonderful reminder of these things, right? The, the faithfulness of God to us over and over and over again. We've seen it in the testimonies, now we've seen it in baptisms. We've seen it in relationships. We, we've seen it every time we get together, don't we? The faithfulness of God repeated, repeated for us. Um, this is what I want to speak to you about this morning. So we're going to take a, a detour from the Gospel of Mark. And I just want to, to talk to you about God's faithfulness to us at Sun Valley Church over the past 20 years. And I want to do that by reviewing what we've covered in the past, past 20 years. So we're going to take 20 years of preaching and make it 20 minutes of sermons. So, and you didn't think that was possible. Well, we'll see. But um, let's begin by asking the question, what is church? What is church? Why did we plant a church 20 years ago to begin with? Aren't there enough churches in the valley to accommodate, you know, a couple hundred more people? Well, as we began our research into starting Sun Valley Church about 23 years ago, we discovered that, in fact, there were plenty of churches in Yakima to accommodate uh, any number of people that might come um, that were strategically located and w with more than ample seating. So why another church is a question I think we ought to consider. And I, th I want to try to answer that question today. For starters, we, we don't want anyone who attends Sun Valley Church to think that church is kind of a social club where we might network with other people, maybe for social interests or business interests, but just a social club. No, we, we don't want to think of it that way. We want to think of church more like we would think about a hospital uh, where we either come to get healed or come to help others get healed. We also might think about church as a military outpost where you come for training, supplies, so that you can go back out into the battlefield uh, of the world and prepare uh, for battle. To have what you need to encounter an enemy that, sh that we each do every time we're out. So that's how we want you to think of church as a hospital, as, as a training center, military training center. And in light of this, what we do here on Sunday mornings is critical. And, and how we do what we do is critical on Sunday morning. Hence, another church. <clears throat> on Thursday evening, March 16th, just a couple days ago, we gathered to celebrate God's faithfulness to us as a church for the past 20 years. And during the testimony time in this room, some of you stood up and shared how you were first surprised or even put off, I think some of you said, uh, that you left feeling church worse than you did when you came. Um, it's always a joy to a pastor's heart to hear those things. Um, some of you said that you came from places that put a premium on making you feel, making everyone feel entertained and, and happy and charging into the week. Now, I've never been to boot camp or basic training, but from what I've heard about those places, soldiers don't come away from those places entertained or happy, necessarily. Now, same goes for hospitals. So how we think about church, how we do church, is important, isn't it? Another question that I want to answer today is, why have we structured Sun Valley Church the way we have. Why is it that we do church the way we do church? Why is it okay if you leave downhearted? Why is that all right? Intentionally all right. Well, listen to uh, A.W. Tozer, uh, pastor, writer from the past century. He said this, a right conception of God is basic not only to systematic theology, but to practical Christian living as well. 
I believe there is scarcely an error in doctrine or failure in applying Christian ethics that cannot be traced finally to imperfect and ignoble thoughts about God. We've got to think about God accurately, don't we? Yeah. The reason we do what we do here on Sunday morning, our strategy, since our very first Sunday, is in fact very unremarkable. It's simple, really. Our strategy, listen to how complex this is, is to get as much of the Word of God into our minds and hearts as possible. <clears throat> what we believed when we started Sun Valley Church 20 years ago, we still believe. That God uses His Word to transform His people. And nothing else. John, Jesus said, for example, in John 17, Sanctify, he was praying for us, by the way, sanctify them by the truth, your word is truth. You want to become Christ-like? There's one path to getting there. It's be by being saturated by the word of God from beginning to end. Nothing else. Not self-help books, not seminars, not conferences, the word of God, period. So we don't have many programs if you've been here for any length of time, you know that. We don't have catchy phrases or statements. We want to keep it simple. Take God's word every Sunday morning and explain to whoever is here. Explain it to them. And then say, have a good week. We don't believe that there's any other way to grow in our faith. There's no other way to please God or to enjoy life for that matter, as he intended. We've tried to keep our programming at a minimum on purpose because we want to give you margin in your life. Margin that isn't filled up with church programs and activities. Why? So that you can faithfully apply the word of God. So when it says to love your neighbor, you actually have time to go love your neighbor. So I want to quickly trace, if you would, the faithfulness of God towards us Sun Valley Church, by tracking the books of the Bible that we have preached here over the past 20 years. First of all, and these are not, by the way, in chronological order. You'll get the chronology as we go, but they're not necessarily in chronological order, so I don't need an email saying, ah, you got that out of order um, from you. I acknowledge that up front, okay? But first point is God's faithfulness in the beginning. God's faithfulness in the beginning. The way I see it, our simple commitment to preaching and teaching God's word to you is a direct result of God's faithfulness to us. God is the one who said that the word of God is living and active in the lives of believers. He is the one who said that it is profitable, that is God's word is profitable for teaching, correction, and training us to be godly. That is why God told us through Peter's pen to crave the word of God as if we were infants and it were pure spiritual milk. Crave it like that. And so, as we began our church, we jumped into 1 Thessalonians. How many here were here when we studied 1 Thessalonians? Raise your hand. All right, maybe one-tenth of, that's, that's good news right? Because that's all that were here when we started, or there, I should say, at East Valley High School. We didn't have many. But I wanted to preach First Thessalonians because just like Sun Valley Church, the Thessalonian church was a fledgling church. I figured that Paul had to say important things to fledgling churches, so no, why not repeat them and, and be preached those things? so that our fledgling church might turn out like the Thessalonian church did. A blessing to Paul's heart. So if you remember, those of you who were here, our first purpose statement was this, Sun Valley Church exists to glorify God by creating an authentic Christian community that lives by faith, is a voice of hope, and is known by love. And as catchy as you might think that is, <clears throat> It comes right out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. In other words, 
uh, we're not too creative here. This is what it says, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, remembering before God and Father your work of faith, your labor of love, and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Faith, hope, and love. That's what we want to be about because that's what Paul told the Thessalonians they ought to be about. This was our desire as we set out to plant a church. But along the way, as we studied 1 Thessalonians, and this is typical of God, we discovered some important things that ought to define us as Christians, as a church. For example, in 1 Thessalonians 3, 12, and 13, Paul wrote, And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you, so that he may be established blameless in your hearts, blameless in holiness before our God and Father. So we discovered one of the primary things that young churches and old churches ought to be doing is loving each other, taking care of each other's needs, joining together outside of this Sunday morning event and participating in each other's lives. And then continuing, by the time we got to the end of 1 Thessalonians, which took us less than a year, 1 Thessalonians 5.24 says, He who calls you is faithful and he will do it. He will surely do it. We were called, weren't we, Sun Valley, starting then. And it seems, at least for the first 20 years, he's been faithful and done it, hasn't he? Amen. What a glorious thought that is. That's just not a thought for churches, by the way. It's a thought for you, Christian, who struggle day to day, maybe feeling almost unending struggle. It says, <laughs> he who calls you is faithful, he will do it. Hang in there. This is the foundation that Paul laid for the Thessalonian church, and we adopted it, made it our own. Now let's look at God's faithfulness and gospel discovery as a church. I want you to see how God demonstrated his faithfulness as we learned, discovered, and applied gospel truths over the last 20 years. One of the fundamental things about God-pleasing churches is their grasp of the gospel. If you don't understand the gospel, you don't understand God. If you want to be a God-pleasing individual or a God-pleasing church, you must understand and embrace the gospel. And so, what did we decide to do? We jumped into the book of Romans, which is... Paul's definition of the gospel, 16 chapters explaining what the gospel is and how you apply it. That's what Romans is. And by the way, we, we looked at Romans, I'm not sure how long that took, I think four years, and then we came back to Romans 8, remember we called it the Great Eight a couple years ago? <clears throat> So we moved into Romans from 1 Thessalonians, and again, experiencing the faithfulness of God. How many here endured Romans? Yeah, a few more. There you go. My, my move into Romans was intentional, but maybe a bit ignorant. As young pastor at the time, I wanted to be sure to fill your minds with gospel truth for the reasons I just mentioned. And I thought there was no better place to do that than Romans. John MacArthur said this, the study of the epistle to the Romans remains a required course in the school of Christian discipleship. You wanna be a follower of Christ? You need Romans. You need Romans. We needed Romans, didn't we? If we were gonna be a faithful, God-honoring, God-pleasing church, we needed to understand the gospel as defined by God's writer, Paul. In fact, after I preached Romans, after I preached Genesis and the Gospel of John, I read J.I. Packer stating that the most important books to preach in a young church are Romans, Genesis, and John. We got lucky. <laughs> or the Holy Spirit's in charge. <laughs> right? I was, in fact, trying to be intentional, but by God's providential goodness and guidance from the Holy Spirit, he guided my thinking and our thinking 
uh, through study and prayer to preach three, through these three monumental gospel books. Why? So that we'd be a gospel-centered church. And you'd be a gospel-centered Christian. That's why. Now, I realize that all of you haven't been here long enough to have heard those sermon series, but in terms of laying a foundation for the trajectory of this church, Romans, and including Genesis and John, were essential, weren't they? Yeah. So the theme of Romans is the explanation and application of the gospel. Listen to this. Paul just lays it out for us in the first chapter, verses 16 and 17. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and then for the Greek. For it is the righteousness of God, it's revealed from heaven, it's revealed rather for, from faith, for faith, as is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Paul announces to his readers and to us, this book's going to be about the gospel, how to get saved, how to have your sins forgiven. Are you interested? Pay attention. <clears throat> so, Paul explains what the gospel is in the first 11 chapters of this great book we studied, and how does the gospel affect my daily living? He, he took the last six chapters to do that, five chapters, 12 through 16. So the explanation of the gospel we discovered in the first 11 chapters was this, that God is holy, we are sinful, kind of the things we heard from our baptismal candidates this morning, and because of our sin, we face God's just judgment, but there is this wonderful thing called grace where we see that we can be justified or made right with God by faith through Jesus Christ, God's solution to our sin problem. And once we've been forgiven our, sin, our sins in our conversion, God begins to transform us into the image of Jesus, which Paul calls sanctification, becoming like Jesus. Once he explains that whole gospel to us, starting in chapter 12, he applies the gospel for us. Romans 12, 1 through 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. So, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. What mercies? All the gospel mercies I've just talked about in the first 11 chapters. Based on all that information, I want you now to start living for Christ. I want you to start being transformed into his image. Here's how we're going to do that. Chapter 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16. He tells you how. Tells us how. Tells us, us how to be a gospel-centered church, a gospel-centered Christian. And then we moved into Genesis. This is chronological. How many here survived the Genesis ordeal? Even more of you. All right? In God's faithfulness, he continued to bring people in spite of Romans 9. Right? As we heard also by way of testimony on Thursday night. Of course, Genesis means beginning, right? The word Genesis means beginning, and we read right off the bat, in the beginning, God. And you're thinking, okay, how is, how is Genesis, the Old Testament book, going to discuss the gospel with us? Since Jesus didn't show up until the New Testament, how is the very first book in the Bible gospel-centered? Well, the whole book Genesis through Revelation is gospel-centered, isn't it? We've learned that. And so, of course, then the first book must be, Genesis doesn't defend God's existence, it assumes it. And with God's existence comes his holiness, which immediately puts us at a serious disadvantage. Because we're unholy, aren't we? And we see the pictures of the gospel come repeatedly, chapter after chapter, as we look at the characters that Moses lays out in Genesis to demonstrate the gospel. Yes, of Jesus Christ. That's why we called the sermon series the gospel in Genesis. This gospel of Jesus Christ, the holiness of God, the sinfulness of man, the solution in Christ and our necessary response was virtually in every single chapter, if you remember. Starting with creation account in Genesis 1 and 2 and the promise of a Savior in Genesis 3, after sin. 
We saw this all the way through the book of Genesis. Week after week, seeing illustration after illustration of God's holiness, man's sinfulness, and God's solution in the coming Savior. The introduction of Abram, if you remember, in Genesis chapter 12, and how God saved this, this pagan, chose this pagan, illustrates the gospel clearly, doesn't it? That story. After God chose Abraham, he began to sanctify him, uh, build into him Christ's likeness, as you heard in the uh, testimony from Josh and Heather. We remember in that study, God's promises to Abraham and Sarah were all gospel-centered promises, weren't they? The promise of a son was the first and most important promise to them. And in chapter 22, after Isaac, the promised son, was born, we discover overt gospel illustration when, when God makes this crazy request for Abraham to go sacrifice this only son on Mount Moriah. Now, Mount Moriah was a three-day trip from where Abraham was living. Why did God need Abraham to go take his only son to Mount Moriah three days away to sacrifice him? Couldn't he have just sacrificed him in the backyard? He could have, but why not? Why didn't he? Why did God send him to Mount Moriah? Someone else's son was sacrificed on Mount Moriah, wasn't he? 2,500 years later. His name was Jesus. And so we have a picture in Abraham's sacrificing of Isaac, which never was fulfilled because there was a sacrificial ram that the Lord provided, Jehovah Jireh, first time we come across that name, Genesis 22. But one day in the future, the Son of God would actually die there for his people. On that same mountain, literally at that same spot, Mount Moriah, Calvary. And then we move to the Gospel of John from Genesis. And I was really anxious to preach the Gospel of John to you. It's always been one of my favorite Gospels. Of course, the Gospel of John chronicles the ministry of Jesus. It doesn't record genealogies, doesn't record birth narratives, just jumps right in to the identification of who Jesus is and then introduces him through John the Baptist. You remember the story, right? How many were here for the Gospel of John series? Raise your hand. The trend continues. So John begins his Gospel account by identifying Jesus as God, who became human to accomplish the salvation that we are rejoicing in today. Listen to this. First verse in John. In the beginning, what beginning? The beginning, before anything else beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And who's the Word? We learned down in verse 14 that the Word became flesh, so it had to be none other than Jesus. Exactly. So, John recorded story after story about the life and ministry of Jesus that could only be explained by the fact that Jesus was, in fact, this God of eternity past. The God who is eternal, perfect, almighty. This was the one who created the universe, entered his creation to be one of us so that he could take on flesh. Why? So that he could lay it down on Calvary, spill his blood for our sake. That's what, the, that's what the book of John is about. A clear gospel presentation so that you might be a gospel-centered person knowing Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. This is the one, this Messiah Jesus was the one who is the fulfillment and picture of all Old Testament stories. All the Old Testament stories that we loved as children, that we teach our children, are not stories about valor or or blessing. They're stories about Jesus. And so when we come to the New Testament and Jesus is introduced, we go, aha. That was him. That was him in the temple. That was him in the furniture. That was him on the mountain. He was the one 
promised by God to Adam and Eve. So the deity of Jesus is central to John's gospel because there is salvation in no one else. In fact, the key verse of John in all of Scripture is found in John chapter 20, verse 31, right? But these things are written, what things? The things that John recorded, these things are written so that you will believe that Jesus, in fact, is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, the God of heaven, and that by believing, you will have life in his name. So in John's gospel, Jesus claims to be God by using seven explicit I am statements. Remember them? I am the bread, the light, the door, the good shepherd, the resurrection, the life, the way, the truth, the life, and the vine. I am, capital I, capital A, capital M, I am all of these things. I am eternally existent. I am everything you need. I am God. This is what Jesus was saying with those I am statements. So Jesus was clearly presented to us here at Sun Valley Church as the God of heaven. Having come to earth to accomplish our salvation, God's faithfulness to us at Sun Valley Church included the study of the Gospel of John. Jesus, friends, is the Gospel. (laughs) No Jesus, no Gospel. There's no salvation without the complete embrace of Jesus as God, who entered the human race as one of us to accomplish only what God, man, can do the God man could do so and then we studied Hebrews and Psalm 119 but we're going to get back to that um, for those of you who are committed to chronology um, but uh, I want to I want to continue with our outline here um, by looking at James we're, we're looking at God's faithfulness and gospel discovery um, not that Hebrews and Psalm 119 isn't f- chock full of gospel, but in terms of understanding where they fit in uh, scripture, I have something else to say about them. But let's continue with God's faithfulness and gospel discovery. Then we, we took on James, remember? And we took on James after we had started Psalm 119. And some of you thought we just went to James because we got tired of Psalm 119. <laughs> and some of us did. <clears throat> it took us over a year to, to get to the one-third mark in Psalm 119. Uh, and so we jumped to James, uh, and I think this was, if you want to call it a detour, a wonderful detour from our study in Psalm 119, because James is such a practical gospel book. It takes the biblical principles of Psalm 119 and applies them to life. But further, James was written to help us examine our faith examine our faith at new and deeper levels to help us determine whether or not what we claim we authentically possess. We claim to believe in Jesus. We show up every week, week after week, participate in church. Is it an authentic thing? James hits it out of the park in this concern. So after studying Romans, Genesis, Hebrews, and Psalm 119, I think that I thought it would be good for Sun Valley Church to pause in light of God's word and examine ourselves and our profession of faith. We, we were all claiming to be believers. So the question that I asked as we began to study James was, does, I, does our life support our claims in believing Jesus? And James walked us through those questions week after week, sometimes uncomfortably. And then now we find ourselves in terms of gospel discovery in the gospel of Mark. That's where we are currently. And uh, what we see, what what we've been learning in the gospel of Mark is that Jesus is the solution to chaos. And where does chaos come from? Chaos, of course, come from sin. Wherever sin goes, chaos goes. Um, sin, we've, we've learned, we've experienced, causes chaos at every level in marriages, society, parenting, churches, communities, and Jesus is the only solution to that chaos, according to the Gospel of Mark. You remember the book was written to the Christians in Rome under Nero. Talk about chaos. We thought we had it bad. <laughs> 
Try putting yourself in that culture. But we learned without Jesus, all of us remain, in, from, from the Gospel of Mark we've learned, that without Jesus, all of us remain in bondage to our selfish, sinful urges to act out continually by the world's standards, which results in an ongoing, downward spiraling chaos. So Mark portrays Jesus as God, but fully man, which is why he refers to Jesus as the Son of Man, our solution to chaos, the God-man. Now let's move to our third point, God's faithfulness in prioritizing Christ. <clears throat> it's one thing to believe in Jesus. It's another thing to make much of him in your life, isn't it? Yeah, I believe in Jesus this, I believe in Jesus that, right. Uh, but let's examine your life when you're not here. How's it look? I argued when we were in John's Gospel that true biblical belief requires us to fully embrace Jesus and make much of him in our daily lives, not just once a week on Sunday, but to fully embrace him, to make our life about him. So we can say that we believe in Jesus, but not really prioritize him, which is why we went to Hebrews. This wonderful but strange New Testament book, Hebrews, which taught us that Jesus is and must be supreme to all of us. He must have superiority over everything in our lives if we are to be what we claim we are. So Hebrews overtly challenges any Christian to view and apply Jesus as the supreme one. Supreme over everything in your life. Put anything on the list you want. Your spouse, your children, your job, uh, your vacation time, whatever. Is Jesus supreme over those or not? He is, but is he to you supreme over those things? When there is a a conflict between Jesus and something in your life, who wins? That's what Hebrews helps us sort out. <clears throat> the book of Hebrews taught us from the viewpoint of the Jews who had been converted to Christianity, once Jews, but now Christian, that Jesus is superior to everything in Judaism. During this study, I think, I don't think, I know, during this particular study of Hebrews, my heart turned a corner. Yes, God sanctifies pastors too. It's amazing. My mind was convinced, my mind was convinced prior to the Hebrew sermon series of the superiority of Jesus over all things, but this particular study convinced my heart. The heart is always, it seems, the last to be persuaded. Is that true of you? You can be persuaded of things intellectually all day long. But it's not till your heart is engaged, not till your heart is persuaded that things change in your life. And that was the case with me. Jesus became obviously superior to any and all cheap substitutes that I and this world has tried to offer myself. Listen to how the author begins Hebrews chapter 1. It's the very first things off his pen. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. Old Testament stuff. He spoke to us by the prophets. But in these last days, today, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. Jesus created the world. You know that? <clears throat> he is the radiance. That is, Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purifications for sin, that is right, he's your Savior who purifies you from sin, he sat down at the right hand of God because it was done. It was complete. It is finished. Actually means something. Your salvation was complete when Christ's work was done. And so he sat down at the right hand of the Father, having become much superior to angels than his name, than the name that he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. And so <clears throat> the unknown author of, of Hebrews used the Jewish religious system to present his case of Jesus' superiority to all things Jewish. And if he's superior to everything in, in Judaism, that means he's superior to everything. For the Jew, their religion was life. Their temple worship, their, the furniture within the temple, the sacrifices, all the way down to the priests who performed all these things. The author of Hebrews presents Jesus as superior. <clears throat> 
Is he superior to everything in your life? Or are you still waging war on that matter? Everything in our lives should be less than Jesus. Nothing should trump Jesus in our relationship with him. He is superior and supreme over every single thing. He must be so in all of our lives. All sin can be summarized by allowing anything that, take, that is allowed to take the place of Jesus as supreme. That's sin. If there's anything in the place of the supremacy of Christ, that is sin. It can be your leisure for Pete's sake. Fourthly, God's faithfulness in gospel application. <clears throat> as you grow in your faith, you begin to understand the gospel isn't just a one-time application event, and then you're good to go and continue on with your old way of living. Uh, it, it's not the old, you know, say the printer's say, prayer and then you're good to go. You got your ticket to heaven, you're on your way, you can just live like you want from now on. No. We discovered by God's faithfulness as we examine the gospel, especially the application of the gospel, that as we learn to walk with Christ, um, we need to remind ourselves daily of the gospel. We need to remember daily the holiness of God and our complete and daily dependence on his grace and mercy because of our sin. We, we need to remember that it is God's word applied by God's spirit that sustains God's people. <clears throat> and so we got to Philippians two-thirds of the way through our Psalm 119 event. Anybody sit through the Philippians series? Anybody remember what the, the title we called that series? Gospel Partners. Remember that? So we completed James, went back to Psalm 119 to cover the, another third of that great chapter. About a year later, we went back to Philippians. And then after Philippians went back and finished Psalm 119. Part of God's faithfulness and gospel application means that we must take this amazing gift of God to our friends. And what's the amazing gift of God? His Son, Jesus Christ. Friends, we must not just hoard our good fortune. We must not just hoard Jesus and keep him all to ourselves and ignore the needs of the world around us who are on their way to hell. The world needs Jesus. We have him. Let's share him. Right? This is what Philippians was all about. Gospel partnership. Do you know that if you take Jesus to your friends that you are actually a partner with the Apostle Paul? You're a partner, in fact, beyond him with Jesus himself? That's what, gospel, that's what we learned in, in Philippians. How many are here today because someone invited you to Sun Valley Church? Quite a few of you. Yeah. Those people who invited you are gospel partners with Paul. So it, it should play out that all of us who have received this blessing of Christ, this blessing of the gospel, forgiveness of sins, and a, a Holy Spirit that changes our hearts daily, that's something that ought to be shared with people around us who are in need. Don't you think? So this is what we ought to be about. And then Psalm 119. God's word is supreme. <clears throat> Here we are full circle. Right back where we started. And this is what we learn in Psalm 119. God's word is supreme. And of course, God's word includes Jesus Christ. Even as long as it took to get through this great psalm, we learn from those 22 stanzas that God's word must fill our minds and hearts in every area of life, didn't we? Yeah. So do you struggle with obedience, Christian friend? God's word is the answer. Do you lack joy? God's word can supply that. Do you struggle in relationships, vocation, finances, contentment, spiritual victory? God's word has the answers for those things. And so we at Sun Valley Church must be saturated with God's word. So, as long as you attend, we're going to preach God's word to you. We're going to teach God's word to you in our Sunday seminars. We're going to pray God's word together. We're going to sing God's word. We're going to memorize God's word. We love God's word, right? Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> God of heaven, we exalt you at this time. <clears throat>
because it is your faithfulness that has brought us to this time. It's your faithfulness that has um, been the reason for our sanctification, our salvation, for our spiritual growth, for our passion for you is all because of your faithfulness to us. So Lord Jesus, we exalt you uh, and the Father and the Holy Spirit because of your great faithfulness to us at Sun Valley Church. We lift up your name in praise and adoration, acknowledging that we are nothing without you. Lord Jesus, please continue your faithfulness to us in the years that come. It's only because of your faithfulness that we can continue. And we pray this in your name. Amen.